Thank you. So I'm. I have a mic here. So you want me to use two mics? I see. Oh, I feel like a star here. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry I cannot give my presentation in Korean. Instead, it will be in Latin. <laughs> Enumeratium modorum quibus figure plane rectilinee per di diagonales dividuntur in tri triangula. <laughs> so the talk I'm giving today is actually, this whole presentation was actually made by Emmo Welzel, who is professor at ETH Zurich. I heard his talk recently and I liked it so much I thought it would be perfect for this kind of audience at this winter school. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of the Catalan numbers. And the original application of the Catalan numbers was exactly this problem here. In how many ways can we triangulate a convex n-gon? So, well, if you have a triangle, you cannot triangulate it at all. It's already triangulated, so there's exactly one way of doing it. If you have a square, there are two ways you can triangulate it, right? Either like this or like this. And for a five gone, it already becomes more complicated. Um, well, we'll see. So it's important perhaps to, to notice that, that I consider the vertices of this polygon to be labeled. So of course, if you take the square here and you draw one diagonal and you draw this diagonal, these are the same up to rotation by 90 degrees. But I still consider them different triangulations because you can think about the vertices here to be numbered 1, 2, 3, 4. And so in this triangulation, number 1 is connected with number 3. And in the other one, you would connect number 2 with number 4. So let me call this number Pn. We see the, the two bond, there's only one way to triangulate it. This is a little bit, little bit a strange case. The triangle, there's one way. The four gone, there are two ways depicted here. The five gone, well, there are five ways, and I've shown them here also. One way to look at it is to observe that the bottom edge here must be connected. There must be one triangle. So it could be either this one, this one, or this one. And in these two cases, there's two, two possibilities for putting this diagonal. So these are the five possibilities of triangulating a pentagon. Now this problem is very, very old. It goes back to a letter that was written by Leonard Euler to Christian Goldbach sometime in the early 18th century. So the letter is dated actually from 1751. And Euler writes to Goldbach that he recently made an observation that he found quite remarkable, which says, well, in how many ways can you, can you cut a given polygon by diagonals in triangles? So for instance, the, the quadrilateral A, B, C, D can either be cut by the diagonal A, C or by the diagonal B, D. And so there are two ways to do this. And uh, then he somehow managed to compute these numbers up to n equals 10. So here we again see the numbers 1, 2, and 5. We already knew. So for the hexagon, there are 14. For the heptagon, 42, and so on. And we don't know how he computed that. It's not explained in the letter. But he does write that his approach was um, quite painful. And he, he had no doubt that there should be a much easier way to do this. So the problem was then solved a few years later. So the letter was from 51, 1751. And in 1758, this, this person, Johann Andreas von Segner, that's him, um, he looked at the problem and he discovered this recurrence here, which we call today the Catalan recurrence. So he found that the number of ways to triangulate an n plus 1 gon can be expressed by this summation here. So pn times p2 plus pn minus 1 times p3 plus pn minus 2 times p4 and so on up to p2 pn. And how do you get this? Well, of course, exactly the way I, I looked at the problem on the first slide. So imagine you have this 
this n gon here, in this case a 6 gon, and you have to triangulate it. So let's look at this bottom edge here. I put an arrow on it and I will call it the root edge. So this is the marked edge of the polygon. Once you fix this one, then well, you can think about these are vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right? So there must be some triangle that's incident to this edge here. There must be one triangle, right? How many possibilities are there? Well, it could either be this triangle, or this triangle, or this triangle, or this triangle. Right? Any of these is possible. You can just pick one of the other vertices and make a triangle. And then, of course, the question is, in how many ways can you triangulate the remaining part here? So in this case here, you have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 gone on one side and nothing on the other side. In this case, you have a 4 gone and a triangle. In this case, you have a triangle and a 4 gone. In this case, you have a 5 gone and nothing. And now you see why I introduced the number P2 before, because P2 is better than saying nothing. So P2 is the number of ways to triangulate this 2 gone here, which is simply 1. Right? There is nothing to triangulate. I, I, call that the 2 gon, and I write, I write P2 for it. And so then we get the 5 gon times P2, the 4 gon times P3, the 3 gon times P4, the 2 gon times P5. And then we calculate it, and we get the correct number, which is 14. Okay, and of course, the same argument works for general N, and then you get this expression here. Now, this is the original article. You should always cite the original literature in your papers, right? So this is the original article. And you see here, oops, sorry. You see here, so for the hexagon, there are 14. For the heptagon, 42. For the, here's a strange way of writing octagon, 132, and so on. Um, and here is the solution. So here, this, here he describes the solution. And what's very interesting about it is, so here, um, yeah, he has uh, the index here, 0 to n minus 3, n minus 1, I guess this is supposed to be. And then he puts the letter here, a, b, c, up to q. So he doesn't know about indices. So he cannot write p1 or p0, p1, p2, up to p, n minus 1. Instead, he uses a separate letter for each of them. And so then the formula you get is this one here. So 2 a, q, right, once at the beginning and once at the end. And 2BP, BP, 2CO, and so on. And of course, this is tricky because, so if you have A, B, C, D, E, F, so then you would have A, F, B, E, C, D, each of them twice. But if you have another one, G, then you have one left in the middle, and you get a D squared at the end and only a single term. And so indeed, you see here he has to, um, if the number is un impar odd, <laughs> then he has a different formula, right, which ends by the dd term here, which is a d squared. So we are lucky that we have so much better notation nowadays. Um, Euler was very happy to see this solution. He, uh, he um, uh, checked all the calculations and he found actually that, that Signa had made a mistake. So instead of, so he had calculated somehow 751,900, but it should have been 742,900, which of course at a time when there were no pocket calculators was uh, quite forgivable mistake. So this is the table as Euler calculated it. So you see here the, the corrected number for 15 is 742,900. And this is up to 25, this is how far Euler did the calculations. Um, now, originally, already in his original letter to Goldbach, Euler had made a conjecture, namely that the numbers increased like this. So p n plus 1 is 4 n minus 6 over n times p n. Right? So he, he had conjectured that, that there is this recurrence governing 
sorry, PN plus 1, that there is this recurrence governing these numbers. But he said, Auctori huius schediasmatis non displicaturum es esperamus. There is no hope, he has no hope that this can be, be proven. And indeed, it took quite a long time. It took 80 years until 1838 that this was in fact proven, so this recurrence was proven, by a French mathematician named Gabriel Lamé. Um, we didn't find the original paper here, so this, what's shown here, is actually a paper by Catalan, but Catalan starts by saying that this Monsieur Lamé has proven the equation, that this equation leads to this recurrence here. And from that he then deduced the formula for the Catalan numbers. So Catalan only entered this picture here much, much later. So, uh, let me see. Okay, so let me give you a proof. This is not Catalan's or, or Lame's proof. So let me give you a proof of this recurrence relation here. And uh, so there is a new proof technique here that Emo is nicely calling the multiply decorate by Jack technology. So similar to divide and conquer, these are the three steps, multiply, decorate, biject. So we start with this recurrence here. We multiply to get the end to the other side. So now we have this picture here. At the same time, I have split this term here. So the 4n minus 6, I have split out the number 2 here. And now comes the magic. So I will find a bijection between the triangulations of the n gone and the triangulations of the n plus 1 gone. And the, the bijection will be such that um, for, for every triangulation of the n-gon, there will be 2 times 2n minus 3 different ways of getting a triangulation of the n plus 1 gons, but we get each triangulation here exactly n times. And so this will be a perfect bijection, and that proves then, of course, this relationship here. So the bijection works as follows. So look at the n plus 1 gone. So this is an n plus 1 gone. There's one fixed edge, which I call the root edge. And this is the n gone. Now, for the n plus 1 gone here, let me decorate a boundary edge, which is not the root edge. So this is an n plus 1 gone. Minus the root edge means there are exactly n edges. Right? So there are n different ways to decorate this triangulation. Right? That's why the n is here. So there's n different ways to, to decorate one triangulation. Okay, so once I've decorated this edge, what can I do? I can collapse this edge. Right? So I can fold this triangle, flutch, and then of course I get an n-gon and the triangulation of an n-gon. Now what do I get then? I get this triangulation of the n-gon, and somehow now this edge here is special. Right? So how, do you, how can you go back from here to here? Well, you have to know that this is the edge that you have to expand. But you actually also have to know in which direction you have to expand it. Right? You, could either, you could either open it up like this, or you could open it up like this. And so, so to make a bijection, you have to know the, the direction of this edge. So what I do is I pick any edge of this polygon and orient it. And how many edges does a triangulation of the n-gon have? Well, if you paid attention during Higab's talk, you know that the answer is 2n minus 3. So that's uh, a triangulation of an n-gon. You can also easily check it, right? For a triangle, you have, you have 1. For a foregon, you have 4. 2 times 3 minus 3 is what? 3 edges. OK, we have to count the number of edges. Right? So 2n minus 3. For a triangle, you get 3. For a foregon, you get 2 times 4 minus 3 is 5. OK, so it works. And then, of course, we have to multiply by 2 because we have to decorate this edge. And now we have a bijection. Right? Each of these objects, by opening up the triangle, you get an n, an n plus 1 gone with the triangulation, and you have decorated one edge of this n plus 1 gone.
And now, now that we have this recursion, all you need to do is to telescope this, this uh, recursion to get the formula for the Catalan numbers. Right? So we actually start with Pn plus 2, so that's 4n plus 1 minus 6, so that's 4n minus 2 over n plus 1. And then you write down all these terms back to P2. And then you do a little bit of magic. It's not difficult, right? You pull out the 2 here, you get a factor here. Then you insert the missing terms, which is easy because each of them is, is 2 times n factorial. <coughs> And so you get an additional n factorial here at the bottom. And so in the end, you get this formula here, which is a Catalan number Cn. So the number of ways to triangulate the n plus 2 gone is a Catalan number Cn. Now, this new proof here that I've showed you actually gives you a nice thing as a byproduct. Namely, it allows you to find the random triangulation of a convex n gone very, very easily. But all you need to do is pick a triangle, start with a triangle, pick a random edge and orient it randomly. So I take this one here and then open it up. So you get this one here. Again, pick a random edge, orient it randomly and open it up. So then this will open up. So then you get this one here. Again, pick a random edge, open it up. So you get this triangle, pick a random edge and open it up. And now you have a random triangulation of the seven gone. And if you think about it for a moment, this really generates every triangulation of the seven gone with the same probability, right? Because we have this nice, um, we have this nice bijection here, right? So here, if you look at all possible triangulations of the n gone, then with equal probability, we, we pick one of these many things. And that means that each one of these will, so this multiplicity n here, each one of these will, will occur equally often. Okay. Nowadays, today, when you think about the Catalan numbers, actually, then combinatorists, the first thing about generating functions, because when you look at this recursion here, this immediately reminds us of polynomial multiplication. Right? So this, this here, if you think about these things as being the, the coefficients of, of a polynomial, then this is exactly what happens here. And amazingly enough, this is already what Euler saw in 1751. So he had, he had observed that if you write down an infinite series, of these, these numbers here, then this sums up to this number here. So when you set A to be one quarter, so you fill in one quarter into this formula, then it turns out that this here is four. And uh, this is the reply from Goldbach to Euler, um, where, he's, where he said that he could verify this. Um, so he says here, well, if you had asked me to de determine the coefficients of this series with this result here, I would, uh, I would have given up. I would have had no idea what, how to attack the problem. But since I already know what the answer is, I came up with two solutions of solving it here. And of course, there's a big, uh, uh, large theory of generating functions that I don't want to talk about. So let me just mention a few applications of the Catalan numbers. Um, maybe one that computer scientists know well about is parenthesis expressions. So if I give you n pairs of parentheses, so n opening brackets and n closing brackets, in how many different ways can you form a string which is correctly formed, which is syntactically correct, opens and closes correctly? Well, that's exactly the Catalan number Cn. So just as an example, if, if n is 1, well, there is one way to do it, right? And if n is 2, there are two ways to do it, namely either this one 
or this one. And let's see if n is 3. Then there should be five ways, so maybe this one and this one and uh, this one and no, I already had that. Okay, let me not try to do it. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure there should be five. Um, and uh, well, why is that two? So of course, to verify this, one way is to simply verify that that this that this number here is is uh, fulfills the Catalan recurrence. So if you take a sequence of n brackets. So how many different ways are there to do it? Well, look at the first, the first letter. The first letter must be, must be an opening bracket, right? So there will be this opening bracket, and then there are some things inside, and then this closes again. And then there is the rest of the sequence. So if there are, if there are k pairs inside here, then the n minus 1 minus k pairs afterwards. Right? Because for everything that starts here, it has to end inside here. So this must be a correct sequence, and this must be a correct sequence. And so you get, you get that here you should, have, you should have ck times cn minus 1 minus k. And, well, what is a possible value of k? Well, it could be 0, or it could be n minus 1. Right, so we have to sum this where k goes from 0 to n minus 1. And then you get cn. And that's, of course, exactly the Catalan recurrence. Now, another example is crossing free perfect matchings. So that's something that looks a bit like graph theory. So you have a convex n-gon, and I require you to connect to pair up the vertices of this convex n-gon, and they are not, not allowed to cross. And it, this looks like a different problem, but in fact, it's exactly this problem here, because you can just start somewhere, let's say here, and then you go around clockwise, and you draw an opening parenthesis when you meet a vertex, and you draw a closing one when you see the other endpoint of an edge. So let's say we start here, we go around, open, 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 close, open, open, close, 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 close. And that way you get a well-formed parenthesis sequence. So it's exactly the same problem, actually. Now, finally, another computer science problem, which is famous because, well, it has something to do with random search trees. So how many different binary trees are there on n vertices? And so again, this fulfills the Catalan recurrence. So with one vertex, you get one. With two vertices, there are two possibilities. Right? And so for three, there are five. And one way to see it, so if you have n vertices, then you have to have one at the root. Then you must have a left subtree with k vertices. And you must have a right subtree with n minus 1 minus k vertices. And again, you have to, to, to have look at all choices of k. So k goes from 0 to n minus 1. And that gives you all possible trees. Um, and now, what can we do with all the things we learned today? Well, we can try to apply this, this bijection. Oops, sorry. We can try to apply this bijection trick we learned here to this search tree problem. And that actually turns out to be useful because, well, because of this random generation property that we looked at for the triangulations. So if you, if you are familiar with, with random search trees, so one of the arguments in random search trees is that if the insertion sequence of the objects you have is random, then the tree you get is nice with high probability. So, so you somehow talk about a random binary search tree. And uh, 
So let me look at this a little bit. So, so for, concre for concreteness, let me, let me actually draw them a bit different. So I'm talking about the binary tree that consists of these white nodes here. So this is a tree on six nodes. But I'm adding here, um, I'm adding here, a, sorry, I press the wrong buttons all the time here. I'm adding a leaf here so that this becomes a perfect, sorry, not a perfect, but a complete binary tree. So there are no, there are no nodes of degree one anymore. So I'm adding, I'm adding one of these blue leaves at the bottom everywhere, and I'm adding a new root node. So the triangle is now a fixed root, and there are all these leaves here. And uh, of course, you know that binary trees, if there are six, six inter interior nodes here, then there must be exactly seven of these leaves here. Right? Seven leaves, six interior nodes, and there's one extra root. So when you build a random search tree, what happens is that you take a random leaf, you take a random leaf like this, and then you expand it. Right? You turn it into an interior node, and you make two children here. So this was what happened here. I picked a random leaf, I expanded it. I pick a random leaf, I expand it. Right? So that's how you get a random search tree. But it turns out that this process does not generate all the possible trees on n nodes with uniform probability. What it does is to create these random binary search trees. And that's a different distribution on the set of trees than the uniform distribution. Right? If you really look at, at all the possible trees you can make, and you want to generate one of these with uniform probability, how would you do that? So that's the question I want to look at at the end of this talk here. You know that there are CN different trees on N vertices, and now I want to generate one of them randomly, but such that each tree has exactly the same probability. And amazingly, there's a very simple way to do this. Namely, you pick a random edge, uniformly at random, and then you, you either expand it to this or to this with equal probability. So you, you add an interior node on this edge, and then you either make, make a new left leaf or a new right leaf. And, well, if you, so, so now you see why I had to add these extra leaves here. So I have to use this edge and these edges here in this process so that this correctly works. And uh, do you see why this is correct? So let me first show you the, the picture. So here I pick a random edge. I expand it, so I, now I pick a, I put a, a leaf on the left like this. Um, I pick another random edge, and I do this process here, right? So here actually, so here it doesn't matter which of these two choices you make. In both cases, you get the same picture here. Now here I pick the root edge, and I expand it like this, and that will be the end of the talk. But let me explain why this, is, why this works. Why is this correct? So remember this equation here. So now we want to use it for the Catalan numbers. So I need to write down the same equation for the Catalan numbers, where it turns out to be 4n minus 2 over n minus 1, see n minus 1. Right, so th this is a little bit different because Pn is Cn minus 2. Right, so here, if you plug in here n plus 1, then you have P n plus 2 is 4, and I see what I did wrong. Yes. Okay. Okay, so let's do the same trick as before. Let's bring the n plus 1 to the left. n plus 1 times cn is, and the uh, same procedure as before, 2 times 2n minus 1, cn minus 1. And now we somehow need to figure out what this means in terms of the objects that I've been showing you. 
So what could n plus 1 be? If you have, if you have this is a tree after the insertion. It has, it has n white interior nodes. So what, of what object do you have n plus 1? Of the blue leaves here, right? And so which blue leaf am I talking about? Well, the one that I created in this step here, right? So this leaf here, I have to decorate. So here, I decorate a leaf. And now, well, if you have decorated it, so if you know that you're talking about this leaf, then you know exactly how to go back to the, ed, to the tree with n, n minus 1 nodes, right? Namely, you take the parent and you delete it from the tree. So like this. And same, so same here. So pick, pick say, this leaf here, and then I take the parent and I delete it. So what happens will, will be that this leaf now becomes a child of this one here, like this. Right? So yeah, I can do the step backwards. So now we have to figure out, well, what's, what's this, this red thing? So somehow this 2 times 2n minus 1 are the decorated red edges here. So first of all, there are two ways to decorate them, namely either if I get this one or this one here. So you can think about this as oriented, orienting this edge, or just a flag which says whether I will go to the left or to the right. So for instance, here I have, I have looked at this leaf, I've decorated this leaf, so I deleted the parent here. Now I, if I go forward again, I have to make a choice if I insert the new leaf on the left or on the right. In this case, I did it on the left. So these are the two choices here. So that's left or right. And now I'm left with the number 2n minus 1. And miracle, 2n minus 1 is exactly the number of, of edges in this tree here. Because it has n, right, sorry, it has n minus 1 nodes and n leaves. Each of them has an edge towards the root, so they're exactly 2n minus 1 edges. And so that establishes that this is really a bijection. And so if you can generate all these objects with equal probability, so you generate all of these, then for each of these, you have 2 times 2 n minus 1 possible ways of going to, to a tree with n nodes, and you get each of them with, with multiplicity n plus 1. And everything is perfectly uniform. And so that is how you can generate really random trees, binary trees, with uniform probability. And uh, as I promised, this is the end of the talk. Um, this is how Euler used to say goodbye in his letters. Very polite language. I cannot translate it. And this is a 10 franken bill. This is Swiss currency with a picture of Euler on it. Thank you.